In spring 2018, Reverend Dr. Clint Moore, Director of the Center for Clinical Ethics at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge, Illinois, spoke to a group of myasthenia gravis patients. He addressed making difficult treatment decisions when you're ill. Here's an excerpt from his talk. I, I want to give you a little insight into what I do, so you know, some of this, some of the presentation is about ethics. And you might think, wow, ethics is sort of boring, but uh, when I think about it, ethics is in everything we do. Uh, and you'll see in a minute, my, my version of ethics is um, anytime we're, we're thinking about how to behave toward another human being, that's ethical thinking. So here's, here are some objectives. We're going to talk about terms and approaches in decision making. And this is sort of an insight into how, how my brain works at work, because I, I get consulted um, for particular cases to see uh, particular patients or families, particularly when there's disagreement or there's a question about what to do, what not to do. Can this person make decisions for themselves? Can they refuse treatment? Can they demand treatment? Um, their doctors made a recommendation and they disagree with that. So there, there's a number of different ways of looking at that in terms of principles or values. We'll talk about conflicts. Um, just because there are these nice principles and values doesn't automatically mean there, there aren't conflicts. Um, and then we'll look at some alternatives. Okay. So morality, and this is, again, you don't have to agree with me, but this is just sort of uh, for the sake of the, the, the next uh, period of time that I have with you. This is sort of the definitions that I work with. So uh, morality is, is really a, a look at uh, into human behavior in terms of what's right or wrong, good or evil. Okay. Um, and that might be cultural, it might be religious, it might be legal. Values, uh, it's a matter of importance to an individual or a group which provides inspiration and motivation for their behavior. So someone, uh, can someone give me one of their values? Kindness. Kindness, good. Anybody else? Honesty. Uh, one more. Excuse me? Trustworthy. Almost sounds like we're moving toward the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts. That's good. <laughs> so ethics is really a systematic process. It, it's really a system of looking at human behavior in terms of what ought to be done. Not what can be done, not what will be done, but what ought to be done. So an ethical issue is when any issue in which there's a question about how we might behave toward another person. A dilemma, now that's, this is where I usually uh, walk in the room, um, is, is when there's a conflict of values. A physician or a family has one value, a patient or someone else has another value of, of pretty equal importance, and they conflict. Um, and we could just say, oh well, too bad, or we could provide a process to them try to help walk them through is there a way we can come to a consensus about moving forward because again this is uh, you know Lutheran General is a pretty good sized hospital and you can't just freeze time you can't just say oh well we'll just sort of put everything on hold for 24 hours um, nothing stays on hold in medicine so in, in particularly in a big hospital uh, bad things happen very quickly. Good things happen very slowly. That's not to be pessimistic, it's just the way it is. Um, so you can't um, just freeze time and hope that, that uh, you, know, you have 24, 48 hours, although sometimes you can. All right. Uh, I would imagine some of you saw something that resembled this. I hope, if you drove here. You saw something that resembled this. So if you saw that, what would you do? Actually, what ought to be done, you should stop. Same question. 
Yeah, it's a little tentative there. That's all right. Now the hard one. Here comes the test. Okay. So here's what I want to do. Uh, the people who said speed up, if you're able, raise your hand and keep it up. Okay. So keep it up. So the the everybody else look around at who has their hand up. Because if you see one of those faces in your rear view mirror, <laughs> just know we're coming. That light's yellow, you either better go with us or just get out of the way. When I say, drives my wife nuts. You know, she would like to stop 30 yards from the intersection if she could, but I just go. So really, that's, you know, there, there are very few things in ethics that are just red or green. You know what exactly what to do or what not to do. So, so this green light or uh, yellow light is, is really uh, that's the question about what we ought to do. And again, ethics provides a systematic way of doing that. At least in my brain, it does. So, this is a question. Um, I'm just going to read this for you because it, it's, uh, it's interesting where it came from and when it came. And it's also appeared in several court cases. Autonomous, and, and you can, I'll ask if folks disagree with this or agree with it. Autonomous actions should not meet with any controlling constraints by others. In addition, the principle of autonomy must not be subject to any encumbrance as might occur in recognizing the autonomous rights of individuals so long as their thoughts and actions do not seriously harm other persons. So what that means is your ability to choose what you want to do should not meet with any limits from other people as long as your choices or actions don't harm others. How many agree with that? Okay, about half the room. So interestingly enough, this uh, this came from uh, Tom Beecham and James Childress. So they were uh, Tom Beecham was on the committee from the Belmont report. The Belmont report was a report written about the Tuskegee study. The Tuskegee study in the study of the language. I'll just, I mean the language of the study was a study that looked at the natural history of syphilis in the Negro male untreated. What does that exactly mean? One, that means that they had a group of men, this was in Macon County, Georgia, who had syphilis, who were not told that there was a treatment. This study started in about 1936 or so, 34, 35, 36. It went to 1972. So what world event occurred between 1936 and 1972? World War II. So one of the co-investigators who was on staff at Johns Hopkins University the Deputy Surgeon General of the United States, wrote a letter to the Macon County Draft Board because half of the men in the study got draft letters. And uh, I had a draft card. So, you know, if you get drafted, the first thing you do is report to your draft board, and then you get a physical. Well, if these guys got physicals, including blood work, the doctor would then know that they had syphilis and could tell them that they could get treated. So the investigator wrote and said, I, I want you to let these, please just rescind your draft letter. Thank you very much. Which they did. So the men never got their physicals. They never knew that there was a treatment for their syphilis. Um, so, Certainly, 
that interfered with their ability to be autonomous or make choices for themselves. However, another little piece, and it's particular to, to Illinois, and I saw, is it Bill? Okay. So Bill has a great shirt that I, I would, it'd be way too big on me, but uh, uh, I mean, he's a strong guy. I'm just kind of wimpy. Uh, he's got a big Harley um, shirt on, Harley Davidson across the back. I might be able to put Harley on mine, but not Harley Davidson. Autonomy meets with some constraints. <laughs> but in Illinois, in 1968, there was a, uh, there was a, a highway bill, and the federal government said, we'll give you this highway money if and only if uh, you pass a mandatory helmet law. State said, sure thing, we want the money, no big deal, we'll pass the law, mandatory bill got passed. Uh, a gentleman uh, with the last name of Freeze sued and said it was an overstep of police powers to um, have bikers ride with a mandatory helmet. And he won, which is why Illinois still doesn't have a mandatory helmet law. And the judge in his, the, the Supreme Court in Illinois, wrote as part of his judgment, Autonomous action should not meet with any controlling and constraints by others. In addition, the principle of autonomy must not be subject to any encumbrances might occur in recognizing the autonomy rights of individuals, so long as their thoughts and actions do not seriously harm other persons. Now you might say, well, that Clint, what's the big deal? He or she wants to ride without a helmet. It's not going to hurt you. Well, having been at, at Lutheran now for almost 30 years, before that I worked at the University of Chicago in the emergency room. I started at uh, Lutheran General with the trauma service, have a level one trauma service at Lutheran. So what happens when a, and this is nothing against motorcyclists, I love them, stay healthy, ride as long as you can. Uh, but if you have an accident and you don't have a helmet, What's the, in, what's the first thing that happens? Ambulance gets called, right? Police, ambulance, come. You go to a hospital. If you're injured, let's say you have no insurance. Does the hospital put you out on the sidewalk? No. They treat you. If you have a broken bone or injury, you go to surgery. You might stay in the hospital for four or five weeks, and you might go to rehab so that you can get better, so that you can get on your bike. But if that person doesn't have insurance, who pays for that? We do. So you might say, well, wait a minute. Your actions are harming me. Because I, you, you might say that. So anyway, this is a big, why am I making such a big deal about autonomy? Well, in Western medicine, autonomy has sort of risen to the height of uh, Yet, you know, it, it should just never be constrained. It's what I want, and that's me, and it's my body. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. There's several parts of that. But I just wanted to put that out there. That, um, you know, in other parts of the world, uh, let's say you go to Italy. If you have a accident in Italy, you can go to an Italian hospital, and you say, I'm an American, it's my autonomous right, yeah, it, yeah, right. After they stop laughing, they'll just do what they need to do to make you better, okay? Because the very few uh, parts of the world, except West, Canada, England to some extent, not so much, um, and, and much less South America, but certainly the United States and Canada have a very strong sense of autonomy. So uh, here's one part of, of that autonomous piece. Patients do have negative rights. So a patient can say, I don't want you to touch me in that way. 
I don't want you to touch me with your stethoscope. I don't want you to take my blood. I don't want you to give me a shot. I don't want you to give, take me to surgery. I don't want to do dialysis. Okay? So, so patients have a pretty much unconstrained right to say no. To the point that, even in Illinois, a, a patient who has been determined as non-decisional. So I come in um, and uh, I, I say this man or this woman can't make their own decisions because they don't understand their condition. They don't understand the uh, consequences of the options that are available to them. They can't make a, a reasoned choice. They can still say no. Okay. So that's how strong that negative right is. You can almost always say no. There are some limits to that, but very few. However, there is not a corresponding positive right. So in case law and in statute, uh, really there, there is, although, and I can understand why, patients or families may say, I demand that you do X. Well, the reason why that's not such a strong right is you're, you're actually demanding that another person do something. The negative right is you just stay away from me. I want you, don't want you invading my body. The, the positive right is I demand your participation. Okay? I demand that you give me this shot, and, and I might even tell you what kind of shot I want. So it, it's... That person has the right to say, I'm not going to do that. Okay. Does that make some sense? All right. Patients and families tend to, and, and this is just from my experience, again, you might agree or disagree, uh, focus on what's possible. So is it possible that? You might get better, or my husband, or my wife, or my son, or my daughter, or I might get better. Is that possible? Physicians and caregivers tend to tend to focus on what's probable. There's a difference. So, um, you know, it, it, so uh, does everybody know what CPR is? Does everybody know when you get CPR? So you get CPR in general, unless you're a, a, a newborn, and we're going to leave those out because that's a special case. People who, who get CPR uh, generally are, I, I can describe them in one word, they're dead, technically. Their heart is stopped. They aren't breathing. Their blood pressure is probably zero. Okay. So CPR attempts to restart the heart. There's medications to create an artificial blood pressure. There's a tube that can go in your windpipe to give you uh, an airway and oxygen. And the attempt for CPR is to bring you back to life. Okay. So there was a study on, uh, this was way back when I was watching TV, which I don't not watch much anymore. Um, Rescue 911, if anybody remembers that show, uh, the success rate for CPR was 100%. Uh, Chicago Hope, anybody remember Chicago Hope? 75%. We're going down, but still pretty good. ER, 67.5%. What is the actual data on success rate for CPR for generally for all comers? For people out in the field, in other words, you're not in the hospital, people who are out in the field who may or may not have an underlying disease process. Just give me a number. Excuse me? 2%. It's around 10%. Now, if you have an underlying disease process, it goes down. If you're in the hospital, it goes down further because the presumption is you're sick. Otherwise, I, 
I, we, ha we aren't just renting out rooms yet. We may get to that. But, uh, so you're there because you're sick. So, you know, most people, when you ask them, what's the success rate of CPR? Oh, yeah, I watched the show. It's, you know, pretty good. No, it's not. So, it, you know, it, it, again, it's a discussion about what's really possible and what's really probable. Yeah. Uh, and then they die the next day or whatever. I mean, that sort of thing wasn't a success thing? No. So there was a case that our, uh, the head of our division of cardiology always uh, presented to his uh, new interns and new fellows that uh, there was a Texas man who was um, who was resuscitated 17 times, 16 of which were successful. So the only the, the only thing CP, success rates of CPR look at, except for newer studies who are starting that are starting to look at discharge from the hospital. The older studies are you were dead, now you're not. That's a success. It makes no uh, assumption about your mental status or your, you know, are you better, are you worse? It's just you were dead, now you're not. That's, that's, a, that's a check, that's a plus, that's a gold star. Yes? Are you going to talk about DNR? Yes, we will talk about that. So Don Berwick, who some of you may um, remember as uh, President Obama's Medicare czar, um, he was the former head of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Like him or not, he is probably one of the smartest people in medicine in terms of how the healthcare system works and doesn't work. Uh, but you know, he, he says that we should be, we should really be thinking about all of the things that we do and do they really provide benefit? I mean, are they really making people better, or are we just doing them because we can? We do X because we have the tool to. But do we really think about ought we to do that? 